this year we're bringing in uh, impact investment funds uh, from around the world. Uh, so focusing uh, non-Canadian funds uh, that, that can support social entrepreneurship and innovations in finance. Uh, so the discussions will include new models of investing for social purpose, projects on the forefront of social and environmental chains, and stories from the field and best practices for the future of food, people, and the planet. This week, we'll welcome Coastal Enterprises, uh, and we have Gray Harris, the Senior Vice President, President of Food System Strategies. Coastal Enterprises integrates finance, business, and industry experience and policy solutions to help grow good jobs, environmentally sustainable enterprises, and shared prosperity in Maine and other rural regions. Then the next up is Hatch, uh, and we have India Boyer, who's deal flow manager from London, at uh, speaking today. Hatch's vision is the is to achieve the least possible footprint of farmed and alternative seafood to benefit oceans, terrestrial ecosystems, and future generations. After two years in operation, Hatch has invested in more than 30 companies. Before uh, I, take, uh, I pass it over to Gray to talk a little bit more about Coastal Enterprises and their work, I'll go ahead and do our land acknowledgement. So today I'll begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, as we gather here, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, I acknowledge the traditional territory of the Attawandan, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous people have made in both shaping and strengthening this community, in particular in our province and country as a whole. We'd also like to acknowledge that as we function virtually, especially this year, we are relying on resources drawn from Native and formerly Native land to run our computers, lights, heat, and virtual connections we've come to depend on. A little bit more about Gray. Uh, she's the senior vice president, as I, as I mentioned, uh, and it's a rural CDFI in Maine. She leads action oriented business initiatives in land and sea boost, uh, based food systems. This includes spearheading the development of funds for sector specific lending and investing at CEI. In the past 10 years, she has led financing over 40 million into food businesses, representing over 1,000 jobs in keeping 8,377 acres of farmland in working production. Gray participates on the boards of Wolf, Next Center, and the Maine Harvest Federal Credit Union, the Tech Board of Maine's Technology Institute, and other farm and food companies and advocacy groups. She holds an MBA from the Muskie School of Public Service at USM and a BA from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Gray, for joining today, and I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Let me get my screen. All going. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Chelsea. Uh, we're good to go, right? Everyone can hear me? Thumbs up. We're good? All right. Uh, really appreciate being here today, sharing a little bit about the work um, I do at Coastal Enterprises and an open invitation for everybody to follow anybody to follow up with me um, after this is over. I think we have some time for Q&A but I'm sure there will be questions left unanswered and I'm eager to hear about what you're working on and I'm always happy to share more about what we're doing um, down in Maine and nationally across the United States. So um, my name is Gray Harris. I work at CEI. Thank you for the introduction. I won't um, repeat that. I've been at CEI almost 15 years now um, through what has been an extraordinary time in our uh, local food movement, but certainly just seeing local food as an industry really grow, um, both in terms of consumer demand and in terms of economic activity um, as a driver for the state of Maine. Um, that's always been the case, but we've really seen the past 10 years um, sort of heightened awareness of it and heightened activity. And Maine benefits, um, like the Maritimes in Canada, of having both a terrestrial food system and also working waterfronts um, and a fisheries-based food system. So we pay attention in equal measure to both. 
I'll say I pay more attention, or most of my time is on the terrestrial food system. We have a fisheries and aquaculture group at CEI um, that really focuses on the working waterfront. I focus on the working landscapes, but um, in terms of our investment um, strategy, um, uh, we absolutely focus on both. So as um, Chelsea was saying, we are a CDFI, a community development financial institution. We're about 40 years old. Um, we've been at this a long time. We're mission-driven lenders and investors, and we have particular expertise in rural economic development. And that really sets us apart from some of our CDFI peers across the country, of which there are about 1,200. Um, many, if not most of them, are urban focused. And while there's certainly um, burgeoning interest and in activity in urban agriculture, we know that most of our food comes from the rural countryside. And Maine, if you um, can picture the great, what we call the great state of New England, is the biggest state in New England and is really the strategic stronghold of food production for the Northeast, for New England, if not the Northeast. And that resource has not even been really tapped yet in terms of um, uh, increasing um, production. So all that is to say that um, we are focused on rural economies. As a community development financial institution, we're very focused on creating opportunity for low-income people, essentially creating business um, access to resources for folks who live on the economic, um, outside of the economic mainstream on the margins of the economy. Uh, and we do have a triple bottom line approach where we look at the, um, the viability of the business, but also the environmental impacts and then the social justice impacts. We want to make sure these businesses, um, we want to align ourselves with businesses that are creating really good jobs for people, especially um, people who um, are disadvantaged or underserved or underestimated um, and really can help create the sense of shared prosperity. So I won't go into the details here, but just to say we do a lot of different things at CEI. Um, we have a number, it is a parent uh, nonprofit where most of our lending activity and business advisory services come out of and all of our policy work. But we have a number of subsidiaries too, because we see, we know that there's sort of no wrong door and there needs to be many different approaches um, to solve some of these um, intractable problems around poverty and climate change and some of the other um, things we want to see change. So again, this continuum of capital and support is super important. We know that um, just being a lender isn't enough. You know, there needs to be not only a lot of different kinds of debt that we can offer to um, businesses as a solution, as a tool um, to get them where they want to go, but we also offer equity and then a whole number of like tax credits and other um, uh, facilities. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Catalyst Fund as an example of the work we're doing specifically in the food system space. Undergirding all of our financing is this business advice. We know that without business technical assistance, we could never really do the lending we do. It's sort of the one, two of really making sure we meet businesses where they are, they get the resources they need and are really stood up um, for success over time. We take all of that experience on the ground and we ratchet it up and hope to have scaled impact through a lot of our policy work. So we see how something is working on the ground on a small scale and we think, huh, if there was some policy around that that would affect the broader business community, we want to come forward and advocate for that. So for instance, I've just worked on submitting a bill to the legislature to stand up the Maine Food System Investment Fund which would be capitalized by public bonds to be this really missing piece of capital we still see out there, this very patient, flexible capital, equity, equity-like capital um, that would sort of sit at the bottom of the capital stack and then leverage all the other capital that's out there. You know, after doing this work for 15 years, I've seen that we still need that and my colleagues um, uh, in this space would agree. So in any case, that's a way to bring scaled capital to a broader swath than just the clients we work with. So again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but even in business technical assistance, you see there's a lot of different categories where we um, play. You know, some of it is straight up just business counseling, business planning, um, market research. 
We work with businesses to help develop a quality job strategy. How do they build up their benefits? How do they build up um, their training program to retain, to not only attract and acquire new employees, but also to train them um, to make sure they can retain them so there isn't the um, turnover rate. We definitely have the sector experts um, in agriculture and fisheries because that's such a huge part of the main economy and where we're heading. Um, and more recently, we understand that childcare is a linchpin um, for the business, uh, the business economy, especially for women. Um, that's always been the case, but we're amplifying our work there with an accelerator program and some um, counseling programs, as well as advocating for policy. So, you know, what is, what is food systems at CEI all about? I mean, at the end of the day, what we really want to do is create a thriving and growing local food economy um, in Maine. We have these heritage sectors that have defined Maine's rural communities for generations. But unfortunately, by labeled heritage, they can sort of feel stuck or sort of trenchant in, in, a, in a way that isn't relevant. And so what we're trying to do is how do we help catapult these heritage sectors into the 21st century with new technology and best, best practices, which is actually a term I can't believe I even said because I think it's pretty charged, but essentially climate smart practices um, is where we're really focusing on how do we build a regenerative, sustainable food system on both land and sea that creates profitable, viable businesses and decent incomes for the producers. Um, and that's a disconnect, frankly, that we cannot afford to, um, to continue to ignore. So we want a thriving, growing local food system economy. And we do that through our financing activities and our technical assistance. So we offer lending and business advising. We have an early stage equity fund called the Catalyst Fund. I mentioned it earlier. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a moment. We do initiatives. So we have a grant program for technical assistance um, that we call the Tastemakers Program. And that enables um, businesses through competitive application to access up to $20,000 of consulting um, with consultants of their choice um, to help them uh, grow their business to the next level, um, typically focusing on scaled facilities because we know there's critical infrastructure that's needed in the food system overall in Maine, and we really want to help businesses be that next value-added producer, processor, slaughter facility, value-add um, distributor, and that's a way to um, help those businesses along. And like I mentioned, we do food policy as well, um, and um, mentioned the bill. So um, I think Chelsea mentioned earlier, I think the numbers have changed actually since uh, I did this slide. I think it's closer to 48 million now that we've loaned and invested since 2010. Um, and 2010 was really that year where we saw things changing in Maine, but also I think an awareness across the country, in the United States. Um, and it amounts to 200 businesses and 2,000 jobs and over 400 clients advised. And these are, you know, sort of big numbers, hard to wrap your head around. But to really be clear, we work boots on the ground with real businesses every single day um, because that's where the real work is happening. Um, and it's been super exciting. So just a word about, I think, COVID times and um, the pandemic, just because it seems um, like, you know, here we are in the middle of it. Um, and, you know, one, two things that we've done in particular in the farm sector um, is work uh, with our foundations and funders, you know, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, work with a whole number of different funding sources that offer us capital, that, that have relationships with us with capital, that then we as an intermediary either relend or invest in businesses. Um, with COVID, and so we're, we do financing, we are not a foundation, we typically don't do grants, except during COVID. Um, and then this is part of the whole ethos of showing up and meeting people where they are. Um, the Kendall Foundation, who I've had a relationship with for years, called me up and said, what can we do? This was at the very start of COVID. What can we do? Well, who knows, right? I mean, we were trying to read the tea leaves. We couldn't really figure it out. But we did know that everything was thrown into disarray. And I said, you know, it would be super as if our borrowers, until we knew that our sources of funds would... Um, 
ease off of our covenants and, and how we needed to pay them back. I wasn't sure if we could ease off, um, offer the same to our farm borrowers. So I said to Andy Kendall, it'd be great if our farm borrowers didn't have to pay their loans for three months, if, if we could just um, pay their principal and interest for three months, give them that breathing room, cash in their pockets. Let's not make them report on anything. Let's just give them this breathing room so they can pivot and adjust and figure out what they need to do to this changing environment. Many of our farms um, supply the restaurant industry. And as we know, that evaporated pretty much overnight um, in March and April, just as the season was ramping up. Maine is a tourist economy um, and everybody was gearing up for um, that. So Andy Kendall said, sure, let me take it to my board. He was able to do it. He was able to give us a grant that enabled all of our farm borrowers to not, it paid their principal and interest. It didn't defer it, it just paid it. And it gave them that breathing room to figure out what's next. As it turns out, most, many of them found um, extraordinary opportunity during this time to supply local customers. People really, really wanted that local food. And hopefully that's a behavior that will be sticky and we'll continue after the pandemic. I'm hoping we see some um, shifts for the, for the better. That'll be more long-term. Um, however, I know a lot of these folks are just sort of hanging on and really are waiting for the restaurant and food service industries to come back. Um, and um, I think also just incurring all the other expenses um, through the safety protocols um, that those funds really enabled folks to operate and, and hang on. Um, in December, I'll just mention, um, so that was a smaller project. Larger project was based on our relationship with the Department of Agriculture. And I think this is something we have really learned and I'm probably not telling you anything you already know, is that you know people can do amazing things on their own. I mean, individuals can do great things but teams can astonish. And this was a case where a team came together quite organically to get this done that was just so impactful um, in the four corners of Maine. The Department of Agriculture in Maine um, gave me a call right before Thanksgiving to say we had $10 million of CARES Act funding that we need to move by December 30th or we're gonna lose it. It goes back to Washington. Can you stand up a grant program and get it out to um, farmers and processors um, for investments that they had made in infrastructure since COVID, because of COVID? Um, and can you do this, please, and get the money out the door in like you know a month? So we pulled together the team at CEI. We launched it December 4th. In a week, we were oversubscribed. I went back to the department twice, asked for $5 million more each time. It ended up being a $20 million program. We had 500 applications, of which 437 were eligible for funding. And we approved our last one at 6 PM on December 30th. And we moved $17.5 million in grants to 437 Maine farmers and food producers in 25 days. And that was a core team of three of us working every day, plus our team in IT. Without IT, we could not have shared the information efficiently like we needed to. And without our accounting team to be able to move that money, we would not have been able to um, get that money out the door and set up the systems to do it. Um, and without our relationship with our Department of Agriculture, who was our liaison down to DC, there was no way we could have gotten that additional funding or, or frankly been asked to stand up the program. Um, it was an extraordinary team effort that came together really quickly with an extraordinary impact. That's $17.5 million infused into the main food economy at a time where people were really wondering what what are they going to do? I mean, winter is the slow time. I mean, any, um, you know, any remaining vestiges of income are pretty much gone um, by that time. And so that was, again, we typically don't do grants, but we were set up and we were able to do it. And we couldn't say, you know, we couldn't say no. So I'm just going to switch gears really quickly here. I'm going to try and be mindful of the time. Also, talk briefly about this early stage seed equity fund and then just a couple of deals that came out of it. Um, we've known for a long time, as most of you who are in investing on the phone know, that um, the valley of death in that early stage of a startup or commercializing business is, is 
deadly, right? I mean, there's just not a lot of capital there between friends and family. You can run out of sources. So we thought we're going to create a pool to help not only um, support these businesses at this stage, but also incent other investors to come in um, with us and leverage other capital. And we had a business pipeline, but just not the kind of capital to do it. And so we thought, well, we're going to we're going to pull together this um, this fund. Um, and it really, we knew it needed to be for food system work, really patient, really flexible, um, super risk tolerant, and um, really have a 3D lens on returns, you know, financial returns, social returns, and these nature-based returns that support sustainable organic and regenerative agriculture, stewardship of natural resources. So we launched that and we've invested, it's a very small fund, I'll tell you right now, it's very small. We've made about a million and a half in investments across eight different companies. Um, and we're just trying to pilot this effort um, before um, raising more money for it. We do a lot of convertible notes, a lot of preferred stock, revenue-based, other self-liquidating um, forms. And we want to do more of those as more and more companies want to retain ownership and don't necessarily have a clean pathway to um, an exit through acquisition. Um, and we also want to be able to iterate and be creative as a CDFI. We can, um, we can do that um, just to see what is the financial frontier as we think about transformative investments in particular around um, climate smart practices and climate smart agriculture. Um, this requires funders to innovate with us, right? We don't have the money tree in the backyard. So we need funders who can um, match our sources uh, or match our uses of the funds with the, with, the, with the right kind of source. So we've developed a RIGA, which we call a RIGA because it's a recoverable investment grant agreement. It's essentially a recoverable grant. But we hope it pioneers a way uh, for foundations um, to invest in CDFIs. And it essentially um, simulates um, an LP structure of a typical venture fund. We're calling it a simulated synthetic fund, where the terms you would see um, might be typically what you would see in a, in a, in a venture fund. So um, that is a way we can, at a nonprofit level, have a pool of capital um, that can be funded not only by grants, because as you can imagine, raising grants for this kind of work is actually really tough. Um, and we also want to show folks that you know you can. There is some upside. You can get a return on these kind of investments. I mean, these are not. Um, th these are businesses worthy of investment, but. Again, with that triple bottom line approach, we may need to rethink what returns look like, um, and you know, financially in particular. Um, but also, how do you balance that and value equally the social and environmental returns? And that's what we are doing here. So, briefly, Bluet is wild Maine blueberry, wild blueberry um, sparkling wine. As you know, in Canada, wild blueberries are one of our three native crops in North America. It is absolutely, you know, when we think of a heritage, iconic agricultural industry of Maine, blueberries um, is right at the top. Um, but it's suffering, right? I mean, it's it has been kind of um, languishing as an industry. And so two Mainers who had gone off to do other things in their life, um, Michael Terrian and Eric Martin, um, Michael Terrian on the right there is a winemaker now um, uh, of some regard out in California. And he came back, said, I can do this with blueberries. Why am I not doing this with blueberries? And so they started this venture um, together. And it is extraordinary. It's capturing the minds and hearts of consumers, especially millennials who are looking for authentic, traceable, healthy um, alternative beverages. Um, and they're really innovating on this heritage sector and bringing it into the 21st um, century to meet what is essentially a $20 billion alternative drinks market. Um, and to their supply chain that they have built relationships now with over the years, with over just the past few years, um, with the blueberry growers um, is clearly the most important piece of this whole um, uh, business. And they pay their growers um, 
just about double what those growers get from processors in the region. And that actually suddenly makes the whole blueberry farm proposition um, viable in a way that um, folks were thinking maybe it's not going to be. So in any case, what they're trying to do, so they're just doing their small part. They're starting a trade group. They're trying to build um, activity and awareness in this sector. And we really wanted to support that. Um, Atlantic Sea Farms, I know India is going to talk about aquaculture, so I'll just um, say that yes, we are very involved in aquaculture. I can't wait to hear what India has to talk about. Um, uh, in her neck of the woods, um, Brianna Warner took over um, Atlantic Sea Farms a number of years ago and has been knocking it out of the park. Um, she, we made a preferred stock um, investment in this company, um, two or three over the years, we're sticking with them through the long haul. You know, seaweed's a $20 billion industry. It has like 10% growth. Um, India may need to um, uh, correct me on some of those numbers. But I do know in the US, we import about 98% of our seaweed. And it just seems ridiculous because we have all of this great seaweed. We also import seaweed that has dyes that's maybe not coming from the cleanest, freshest waters. The Gulf of Maine is, has these pristine, wonderful waters, but also the Gulf of Maine, as we know, is rapidly increasing in temperature more than any other body of water anywhere. And that really threatens our one primary industry, which is lobster. And so lobster men and women are wondering, well, what, you know, what, what does this mean? We can fight against that. But at the end of the day, if there are no lobster, what are we going to do? And so kelp farming actually is sort of a perfect diversification strategy for lobstering. It's a different season. It's a totally different product um, and a totally different income stream. So it's a way for um, the lobstering industry to mitigate against their risks uh, going forward. So Bree works with 24 partner farms. Those represent families up and down the coast. Um, it represents about 20 jobs. And uh, they are busy entering markets from sweet greens to um, retail and food service. They've certainly taken a hit during COVID, but they also have extraordinary support from their investors. And that's really important to, um, uh, to mention. Um, and, you know, when we think about the triple bottom line investing that we do, and we know that kelp can remove 20% more carbon than forests, and that it's a great mitigator of ocean acidification by pulling nitrogen out of the water. Um, we just feel like this is a fat, it's a fabulous product. It's doing great things. Brianna Warner is an incredible CEO, um, and she's built a terrific team. So I'm happy to answer more questions, details about either of those um, uh, deals and anything I've talked about, but I think my time is pretty much up and I wanna pass, um, pass this over to India. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gray, that was fantastic. Um, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions on, uh, I mean, the two grant initiatives during COVID was also fantastic. Um, and then the Catalyst Fund and, and all the work that you're doing in, in aquaculture as well. Um, thank you. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce India. So she joined Hatch in 2019 as the deal flow manager and her role and her role is to source, analyze and select early stage aquaculture and alternative seafood startups and companies for the Hatch Accelerator programs. Previously, India worked as an investment associate at Passion Capital Investments, an early stage technology investor based in London. She holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Eco Ecological Sciences from the University of Edinburgh, and she is passionate about sustainable agriculture and the environment. Thank you, India, for being here today. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, for that great introduction. And thank you, Gray, for that brilliant presentation just now. So, so Hatch is a global catalyst for sustainable agriculture and alternative seafood innovation. Um, and uh, so, so in a brief introduction to me, and thank you very much for introducing me already, but I'm the deal flow manager at Hatch, so I sit on the investment team. Um, I studied environmental science at the University of Edinburgh, and I've been working in, in venture capital for about six years now and joined Hatch in 2019. Um, and so some definitions first, what is aquaculture? So it's the farming of aquatic species such as salmon, shrimp, or seaweed, or bivalves, um, something like that. So 
uh, aquaculture has really has, has rapidly increased um, in the last half century, um, and it's now valued over 160 billion. Um, and there are there because it is uh, like comparative to other um, agriculture um, species, and and you know we've we've talked about with gray you know terrestrial farming. It, Aquaculture is, is very is relatively recent, um, and so it, it has this had a very rapid rate of development um, over the last few um, decades. Um, and here we can see in this graph that you kind of cut off the numbers, but so it started really in the 1970s, and it, it's it's now about half of half of all seafood that you eat um, is, is 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 farmed. Um, um, and why uh, alternative seafood? Um, so it is uh, alternative seafood is is plant based or cell based um, seafood. So it's, it's almost like an alternate to to the real um, seafood. And it is it's a rapidly growing market. Um, and but the, we see a lot of gaps. Um, so problems with texture, problems with ingredients and nutrition. Um, some areas that we can we could definitely provide value with with our experience in, in seafood. So we've made we've now made three investments in the alternative seafood space, and we're very much looking to to invest again in that area. Um, so hatch as a whole. So. We are a venture capital fund, and we're also a consultancy and advisory body. Um, and our fund, we, we launched our first fund last year, beginning of last year, um, at eight and a half million US dollars. Um, and we're now, we're currently raising our, our second fund. Um, and in, in, with that fund, we run accelerator programs. Um, we invest equity into, into very early stage companies. Um, and we also run workshops, which are generally non-equity. And actually the workshops kind of, um, they go, they straddle the fund and the, the innovation services. So they're kind of in both camps. Um, and our innovation services is consultancy advisory body that we launched last year. Again, with our, we wanted to kind of monetize our, our experience and, and, and knowledge in the area. And we, some of our clients include industry, um, investors, and, and also governments. Um, this is our team. So we are now a team of 11 people. Um, the first three listed here are the partners in the fund. So Carson, Wayne, and George. Um, and they started uh, Hatch in the end of 2017. And we made our first investments in the beginning of 2018. And we, we all have a background in either in investments or in um, aquaculture or alternative seafood. Um, yeah. Um, so our investment focus areas, um, as I said, we, we focus on aquaculture and alternative seafood um, in, in a very in the very early stages. Um, and they're all generally within these, these five focus areas listed here. So ingredients and nutrition, health and genetics, farm um, software and hardware, and alternative seafood, and also supply chain. And with our second fund, we are also going to be looking into making some more impact, um, impact investments. So that would include regenerative um, aquaculture, so regenerative farming and new farming systems. Um, which would include offshore, RAS, land-based. Um, so that would be that will be um, you know our sixth focus area for, for our for our fund that we hope to um, launch at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. So as a deal flow manager, I manage the Hatch pipeline. Um, we're currently tracking over thousand three hundred companies within the aquaculture and alternative seafood space. Um, this we, we invest globally, um, and so obviously our deal flow is also global. Um, and this little pie chart shows um, kind of the breakdown of those companies that we're tracking. Um, so the majority being in Europe, Asia, and North America. Um, and the main hatch activities is that we run these accelerated programs, um, which and we run four so far. Um, they're an intensive three-month program. We invest before the program starts. Um, and then we help them uh, introduce them to our, our global network of investors and industry um, in order to kind of increase the chance of their success. Um, and I know, Gray, you mentioned the, the valley of death. Um, it's that's definitely what we aim to kind of help these companies in, in overcoming, especially if you look at aquaculture um, 
it's slightly less than an alternative seafood, but if you look at agriculture on a global scale, it's incredibly, it's, it's a large market, but it's very fragmented and it's very, um, you know, there's different geographies and different species. So what we aim to do is very much um, uh, be the overarching connector for, for, our, for our network and, and for our portfolio companies. And, and we also run these um, workshops. So I mentioned those before. They're, they're labeled Hatch Innovation Studios. And these are non-equity and they go even slightly earlier stage. And we use those to develop, um, develop the ecosystem in areas that we feel have a lot of potential, but not necessarily, they don't necessarily have investable technologies yet or, or they haven't even formed companies. So we help in, in um, giving them like, um, kind of very much shortened versions of the accelerator programs kind of can be anywhere from two weeks up to six weeks part time um, and we run one in Ireland and this year we are aiming to run one in Singapore Ireland and also in Hawaii um, and the our typical investments I'll just talk you through what we look for um, when we, we we consider companies for investment. We, we look at the team, we look at their, their experience, so their professional and their domain um, experience in that, in that space. We look at how complete the team is um, at the stage. We try, we try and have like um, invest in companies that have, have, have a complementary um, domain experience and also commercial experience. So, um, and if, for example, we, we and, and if we don't have that, we, we look at their willingness to kind of expand into that area. Or, or kind of build up their team in, in areas that we feel that, that they could um, uh, do with some more um, talent in their, in their founding team. Um, we also look at the market. The market has to be large enough. Um, we also look at, you know, have they identified the, the real problem? Are they close to, uh, you know, are they close to the, their target market? Um, both from a, both from, both from a um, you know, really understanding the problem area, but also kind of having a, a, a very clear route to market. Um, we also look to see whether they can, you know, their scale scalability plans into different, different sectors of the market. Um, we look at their technology. So, is their IP defensible? Um, is it scalable? Um, are they building it in house? Are they licensing it in? Um, all that kind of thing. Um, we also look at the traction. Um, sometimes the companies we invest in are very early, so sometimes there there isn't that much to go on. But we look for any validation that they have gained from from the market, um, and and also, you know, we actually do invest in a, in a range of stages. Um, so if they do have um, some more history with their traction, we'll then dig into to the numbers there and, and then try and do a couple of interviews with um, existing customers um, uh, and or and or look at the kind of the, the the churn rate. So how many how many of their customers have have kind of dropped off and, and why and what they're doing to address that. Um, we look at the competitive landscape as the next point. So what, you know, direct competition, also indirect competition. And we look at, you know, what are their competitive advantages over other solutions um, uh, that um, the competitors might have. Um, and then we also look at their funding situation. How much have they raised already? How much are they looking to raise? At what valuation? Um, you know, are they a good fit for us? Um, yeah. Um, and then, and then how do we invest? We, we took, so, so in the 2020 accelerator program, we invested 130,000 US dollars in investment. That's part, just under 50%, um, actually 50K was in, in kind. So meaning as part of the accelerator program um, and it's, it's 55K in kind and 75K in cash. Um, so, and then we issue that on a convertible loan note and we typically um, issue that in, in exchange for between eight and 10% equity. And the valuations we go in at are typically between one and two million um, US dollars. But we definitely we do have exceptions to this. Um, just trying to give you more of an idea of what, what our typical investments are. But um, I think in our in our next fund, what we'll be doing is considering like a few a uh, few larger um, investments. So instead of kind of the, the pre C and C stage, we'll also be considering kind of Series A and perhaps even Series B um, stage investments. Um, and we also invest globally. I'll go on to show a little map of where our investments have been made. Um, we invest, our, our fund um, life cycle is between, is, is 10 years, but we have the option to extend it by two. Um, and we also, just to give you an idea of our timeline, we, we kind of invest seasonally. Um, 
so meaning that we invest just ahead of our accelerator programs. Um, and so our next accelerator program that we'll be holding is, is um, going to be in 2022. So we'll be considering investments at that, at that time. Um, okay, so this is a, a little map of our portfolio companies. Um, we have, we've made 37 investments globally. And these little orange dots you can see are the location of our, each of our portfolio companies. And then we also have um, indicated here our offices. So we've got an office in Hawaii, one in Bergen and one in Singapore. So 2019 for me was the very busy year. I went to all of these amazing locations. Um, we're located there because of the aquaculture um, ecosystem in each of those locations. So why we're, we're um, based in Melha, which is a, um, it's a, there are lots of aquaculture tenants there, about 80. Um, Bergen is the, is um, kind of the hub of salmon production in, in the world. Um, and then Singapore is, the majority of, of the world aquaculture production actually happens um, in Singapore. And um, across all of these areas, we are also looking at um, alternative seafood um, investments as well, with Singapore probably being a bit of a hub for that. Um, this is our affiliate network. So some of these might, must, might be um, customers of ours or partners, um, or simply we have we have close relationships with them. Um, and so what we do is we aim to kind of introduce our portfolio companies to um, our, our network uh, who kind of make most sense for, to um, kind of start to open a relationship or, or dialogue with. Um, so I wanted to give you some examples um, of success in the Hatch Fund. Um, we are a very relatively young um, fund. So our first investment was made in 2018. Um, but our portfolio has gone on to raise 18 million. Um, and some of the more specific, um, uh, so 18 million in total by, by all of our 37 companies, um, with some that's kind of all secured money. Some of them are in discussions now, which we find very exciting. Um, and then otherwise some more specific examples is that we've made our first exit, which is Genetti Rate um, to IMV Technologies. Um, and one of our impact um, uh, investments or more, more of an impact investments is Symbrosia Solutions, which is, is growing um, Aspirocopsis taxiformis to, to put into cattle feed to reduce the amount of methane that's being produced. Um, and they're doing very well. Um, and then AquaConnect is an example where we've, we've secured follow on funding with them. So they've, they've secured um, the capital from Omnivore VC and they're, they're hopefully going to announce another round um, very soon. Um, and then also some learnings from um, learnings that we've had from from being um, from investing. Um, so we've had three companies that have folded, which at an early stage is is very much to be expected out of thirty seven companies. I think we're doing quite well. Um, but so so one of them I think is if you're thinking if you're if you're someone listening who's thinking of perhaps um, forming a company, I think definitely think about the team. I think some of the some of the companies that have folded have have had um, kind of found a mismatches of direction of the company um, or simply personality fallouts um, that that weren't there at the beginning, but then that came more apparent. Um, you know, as starting a company is very um, stressful, and you want to really make sure that you're kind of linked with the with the right people at the beginning. Um, uh, also, uh, ownership structure. We want to see what we really want to see as investors is that the the founding or the the founding team is kind of has a at least a majority stake in in each company kind of before we come in. So we're typically one of the first institutional investors, and what we want to see is is then they're, they're presumably going to be diluted kind of if they raise subsequent rounds. So we want to see them um, adequately incentivize along with uh, along with the the um, success of their company so we definitely learned that you know we need to to make sure that structure is is um, sound at the beginning and sometimes it's the easiest to have to to make those changes before any kind of institutional investors come on board and we're happy to kind of fight the the um if it's needed to to help justify to, to other members of of the ownership body you know why this is very important and sometimes um companies find that very helpful um, we also find out, sometimes find that some of the reasons and most biggest reasons for companies not, not making it is that they fail to get product market fit. Um, 
And we really try and encourage our portfolio companies to, to think about the problem first rather than solution first, really get to know the, that, that, that problem um, rather than coming up with a solution, trying to shoehorn it into the, into the, um, into the problem. Um, and yeah, I think this is where our global network of, um, I, I said we, we're, we're very affiliated with industry, but we're also on the ground with farmers as well. So we conducted a shrimp report um, in 2019 when we were able to, to travel and that we, we interviewed 96 shrimp farmers across the six top producing um, fr uh, shrimp companies. So, and we're going to conduct a tilapia one once we were able to travel again. So we really do have this network of farmers as well that we're able to kind of bounce ideas off um, the, to, to make sure that our portfolio are kind of building the, the right, getting to know the problem very well before they build a solution. Great, and that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for listening and sorry about the technical stuff.